A prayer for you as we open God's Word. Father in heaven, please be merciful upon us. Please smile upon us with your love, your grace. Give us understanding into your Word and into you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our Bible study today is found in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, we will read verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So the religious leaders plan to not only discredit Jesus, but to destroy him. They begin with flattery. You always speak the truth regardless of whom you are speaking to. Then they ask a question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus knew their wicked intent and asked for a denarius. And the question was given by him, whose image and inscription is this? And he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. They marveled and went away. We will understand this better if we have some context. This is taking place on Tuesday, the last week of Jesus' life. He will die on Friday. Jesus is teaching publicly in the temple grounds. He has just told three parables that condemn the religious leaders. He told the parable of the two sons, he told the parable of the landowner, and he told the parable about the marriage feast. If you would like information about those, you can uh, look on our website and you can get those sermons. We spoke on each of those. So he spoke three times about the religious leaders. Now they are going to speak three times. And theirs will be a confrontation or a counterattack. And it's designed to trap Jesus, to discredit him publicly, and ultimately to destroy him. They will use three hot topic issues, hot topic issues of the day. Number one, taxes to Caesar. The next question will be about the resurrection. And then the third question will be, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Let's look at chapter 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his uh, words or in his uh, talk. The Pharisees, many of you have heard of them. You may have an idea of who they are and what they teach and what they re refer to. And uh, they're not credited with a whole lot of good at this point in their history. However, they have a wonderful beginning. If we go back to the days of King Saul, who was the first king of Israel, we're about 1,040 before Christ. The last king will be King Zedekiah, 586. So for about 450 years, Israel was a monarchy. They had a king. The last prophet is in 425 BC, known as Malachi. And the time period between Malachi and Matthew is known as the time between the Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, or as scholars like to call it, the intertestamental period. During that time, Palestine was ruled by the Medes and the Persians. After Babylon, the Medes and the Persians took over, and Palestine was ruled by them. After them was Alexander the Great. In 331 BC, he conquered the Persians, and uh, his Greek 
uh, state took over. When he died, it was divided in by his four generals, and ultimately, in the year 164, you have Antichius Epiphanes. He's a bad, bad person. He did three things. He, he made it against the law for Jews to be circumcised. He made it against the law for Jews to have any part of Scripture. And he made it against the law for any Jew to observe the Sabbath. And the people died because of this. He also took a pig and offered it on the altar at the temple. Now, during this time period when there is no king, Israel's leader was the high priest. And so that position not only was a religious position, it became a political position as well. And the story is filled with intrigue. It's awful. People were killed so others could be made the high priest. And uh, it was anything but a holy office. And that's the way it was in Jesus' day. The high priest was more political than it was religious, although it used religion to control the Jews. Now, during this time period, with all this corruption and all this evil and all this pushback against Israel and its teachings, there was a group of people that formed, and they were called the separate ones. Their purpose was to preserve religious purity. They were national heroes. They became known as the Pharisees. Their job was to keep things holy, to keep the teachings there. In the year 63 BC, Rome took over that region, and they were the ones ruling in the days of Jesus when this story took place. It is to them that the question of taxation has come. Let's, uh, or about them. Let's look at Matthew 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. So it's these uh, righteous ones that are seeking to entangle him in his talk. They wanted to trap him in his words. In reality, if you think about it, they thought they were smarter than God. In verse 16, it goes on, it says, And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth. Why did they send their disciples? Well, in the Bible, this particular Greek word that is translated disciples means learners, pupils, followers. These Pharisees have been dogging Jesus for over three years. He probably knows each one of them and knows their names. So they're trying to disguise their part in this process. So they send disciples, those who are followers of theirs, give them instructions on what to say, and hopefully they can sneak one in on Jesus. But it mentions the Herodians. Now, the Herodians were supporters of the family of Herod. King Herod was actually not a king, but he was given the title by Rome. He died in the year 4. He is the one that sent the soldiers to kill all the children, two year, all the male children two years old or younger in Bethlehem. He was a strong ruler. His supporters were called Herodians. Now, why would anybody support Herod? Well, they were strong supporters of Hellenization. Greece was associated with Helen of Troy, and the process of Greek influence was called Hellenizing. What some of you know is that Alexander the Great singularly was probably one of the greatest military geniuses to ever grace planet Earth. He just rolled over countries. He rolled over towns and cities. He was fearless. But what you probably don't know is that he was personally tutored as a boy by the great Greek philosopher 
and scientist named Aristotle. And Alexander was conquering not for the sake of conquest, not for the sake of power, not for the sake of fame, not for fortune. He was conquering with the singular purpose to promote Greek culture, the language of Greece, the laws of Greece, the literature of Greece, the libraries of Greece, the theaters of Greece, the hippodromes of Greece, where there would be horse racing. All these were considered superior to anything else happening on the planet. And he came into Palestine. He was celebrated by the high priests at that time. He was embraced, and he pretty much left the people alone. But he brought Greek philosophy with them. Those who followed it were called the Hellenizers. The Herodians that are mentioned here are part of that. They believe in Greece more so than they believed in Israel. They're more concerned with the new way of thinking than they were anything about the old way of thinking. These people the Pharisees and the Herodians were sworn enemies. They despised one another. They represented two entirely different worldviews. However, your enemy, if your enemy is my enemy, we'll be friends. And Jesus was their enemy. All this is a setup to try to entrap Jesus. So, we have the Herodians in verse 16. We've read how they try to flatter Jesus. Teacher, we know you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Isn't it interesting with human nature how we do that without even thinking? When someone is really, really buttering you up, have, have you ever just thought, there's a but coming? There's going to be a however there's going to be, you know, a correction. Oh, you're wonderful, 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 however. And that's what they're doing with Jesus. They're flattering him to set him up. Verse 17, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Why is this even a big deal? The word lawful throws us off. We think they're talking about religious law, or they might even be talking about civil law. We're, we're talking about something that is codified, something that lawyers can study and look at and apply to circumstances, and maybe there's uh, precedent other places. But the word lawful actually in the Greek could be transferred uh, as examine, test, thoroughly by questions, ascertain or interrogate, ask, inquire, search. This is not actually a legal question. It is a question about opinion. This is opinion based on someone's position, and it is more heat than it is light. And that's what the problem is. It's not a biblical issue. It's not a scriptural issue. It's not a moral issue. It was opinion-based, and it was hotly debated. But it was a dangerous question in this sense. If Jesus were to say, it is lawful, then they would denounce Jesus as being in league with Rome. There's no way he could be the Messiah he is supporting a pagan government. If Jesus were to say, it is not lawful, then they would accuse Jesus of rebelling against Rome, of starting a riot, of sedition. And in fact, when you read in Luke 22, verse 3, when he's on trial, though Jesus doesn't say anything about not paying tribute or taxes to the government of Rome, at his trial, the religious leaders will tell Pilate, and this man says not to pay taxes to Rome. Flat out lied about. Is it, if it is lawful, 
they denounce him as being with Rome. If it's not lawful, they denounce him as being against Rome. And if Jesus is silent, then he must be a coward, and therefore he's not one to be followed. You see? They've got him. They've trapped God. There's no way out. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. When we approach life as it's either yes or no, you're putting yourself in an unreasonable corner. Bring God into the argument, and you may discover there's all kinds of options you never thought of. And they certainly didn't think Jesus could worm out of this. And here's what's interesting. It is actually not even an issue. Taxes and tribute have been paid to governments as old as recorded civilization is. It was no big deal. In fact, in the days when Jesus was living, the Jewish people on average paid 30% taxes between Rome and Israel. It was not even an issue. It was not a legal issue. It was not a moral issue. It's something that you did. What was the problem? It was a man-made, created issue born out of dislike more than any moral concern. And because it's born out of dislike, it's emotional base, and it's upgraded to a moral issue, it becomes religious, and it is hotly debated because there's no thus saith the Lord. Look at Ecclesiastes 7, verse 16. We'll read it on the screen. It says, Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? What? What in the world does that mean? That means it is possible to be overly righteous. To make an issue out of everything. Do you know if everything is an issue, do you know what you've got? Issues. <laughs> and yet that's what defines the religion of a lot of people. Everything's an issue. Should we, shouldn't we? Should we, shouldn't we? Can we, can't we? And things are hotly debated and because there's not a clear thus saith the Lord, they're emotionally driven and sides are taken, holy wars are declared, and there is more vehemence, anger, and animosity over these types of things than anything clearly written in the Word of God. So, Jesus responds. Verse 18, Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why do you test me? you hypocrites. Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. It's as if Jesus held up the coin, said, whose Authority is indicated on this coin. And the face of Caesar was on one side. On the other side, his title was given, Pontifus Maximus, the high priest. Whose authority is represented here? Caesar. Well, then render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Duh! The bigger question is how are you recognizing God's authority? They weren't. That's why they're fussing with things that don't matter and completely overlooking, as Jesus would say, the weightier matters of the law. They might be tithing cumin and little tiny spices. They might be straining gnats and they're overlooking camels. This is what happens to people 
when their life is centered in religion rather than in a relationship with a holy God. But this question is an important question. Whose image and inscription is this? If you go back to Genesis, you discover in chapter 1 that man, mankind, is created in the image of God. Whose image? God. Go to the book of Revelation, ten times the word image is used. Not once is it referring to God. Every single time it's referring to an image, to the beast, the enemy of God, and the enemy of God's people. Can you see just from those two examples how important image is? When God holds you up like a coin, whose image does he see? Does he see himself? Or does he see you having or being like the image to the beast? Do you realize there's no other images but those two? There's none. There's none in between. It either is or isn't. Standing in the presence of God, they were arguing, trying to trick God, trying to get, condemn God, trying to outdo God over some issue that wasn't even a biblical issue. Wow. I don't know where you are in your experience with God, but I do hope you are allowing yourself the ability to breathe, to move, and to have your being and not question and question and question your questions, but rejoice in a God who is loving, who is merciful, who is kind, who is attentive, who wants to be with you, who wants you to have hope, who wants you to live a life of joy because in his presence is the fullness of joy. Folks, some people maybe here, some people you know, are simply wound too tight. And they've got issues. And honestly, they're not fun to be with. And when everything's an issue, it's awful. We can be in the presence of God. What would it have been like if they loved Jesus, what questions would they ask him then? How thoughtful would have been their ideas back and forth? But I want to leave you with a question. Only you can answer this because we can't see it. Whose image? Whose image? You if you were to stand before God right now, what would he see? He's either going to see Jesus, your Savior, living in you, or he's going to see the enemy living in you. I hope that shocks you, but that's the reality. That is the reality. There is no neutral ground here. And I'm wondering if there's anyone here who would like to say to the Lord, I want your image clearly in my heart and soul. If you want to say that to God, I invite you to stand. Father in heaven, please help us. We want Jesus in our hearts. Help us to not get caught up in nonsense, but help us to think about loving you and loving others and doing the weightier matters of the law. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.